lights. I've always wanted to do that, that's fun. Uh, lightning talks time, applaud please. Stop. Lights back up. Lights back up. Lights back up. I've got to get off stage. Can we have the lights up again, please? I'm going to try again. Right. Lights. Stop. Much better. Tim Heap. Slides. Thank you. All right. So um, this is the story of me attempting to write a generator, chunks of. Um, it's a generator that many people have tried to, tried to write over the years. Um, there's Stack Overflow everywhere. And I looked at the implementation, and they were all not quite right. So I tried to implement a, a good one, and I got a little distracted. Um, so this is the story of that generator. So the goal of this generator is to make, so t take an iterable and then return some chunks, an iterable of chunks, you can then iter iterate over those chunks so that you can do chunk computation. Uh, the, the code that we're trying to make run is on the screen currently. Uh, there are, as I said, numerous implementations on Stack Overflow. They range from correct to re really not correct. Um, so let's try and find a solution that works in all of the corner cases you're never even going to try and find. So this is the base implementation. This, this works if you get a list. Uh, and that's fine if that's all you need. But it doesn't work on generators. It just like slice doesn't work on generators, so that ain't good for us. Also, it's, it's not over-engineered enough. So. <laughs> Um, there is a function in iterTools called iSlice, and that slices an iter iterator much like you do in a list. Um, you can then continue consuming the iterator from there on and get the rest of the items. That kind of sounds like what we want, so uh, you can try this. Um, if anyone's used iSlice before, you might spot the problem. So it, it groups things, works on lists and generators. Not quite fancy enough yet. And also, it never terminates. <laughs> it, enters an infinite loop that is then an infinite loop and then an in, uh, uh, um, So if you try and isolate an empty iterator, then you'll get an iterator out of it. It will never stop generating new iterators. So you've got to um, check if the iterator is empty. There's a, you can make an is empty thing like this. Um, that will do a little look ahead using T and then um, chain together some iterators and then return you a new thing that actually um, it tells you if it's empty and then an iterator you continue con to consume. So then this actually works. Um, there's a fancy function I use there that you may have seen, contextlib.suppress. It just it does, it does that easy. So please use that one. It's really nice. Uh, so results, groups things, works on lists and generators, actually terminates, N not fancy enough. Um, and it doesn't allow you to garbage collect items as you go which is bad. So the, the data set I was working off was like tens of megabytes, hundreds of megabytes big per chunk. And if you consumed like a thousand of them, you ran out of memory. So we need to allow garbage collection. T doesn't do that. It keeps references around until you consume it across all the iterators. So we can't use T. Um, so the look ahead is never consumed and you have a sad time. You also can't close a T iterator. So yeah, useless to us. Um, garbage collection in Python is an implementation detail. so. It works different on all these things, but reference counting. So if you keep a reference around, that's bad. I'm hurrying through because I'm running out of time. Um, this is a really useful thing you can do that I made that will just print when something's made and deleted. And it's great for debugging generators. Uh, so here's another one, is empty, that just does some chaining things. Um, it works. It doesn't have the garbage collection problems of T. Uh, it groups things, works on list and generator, terminates, not fancy enough. The first item, you can't garbage collect that one because it's in a list. And chain doesn't forget iterators once it's gone past them. So the list keeps around a reference, and then you've still got problems. Um, so you can't do that one. So here's another one. <sighs> yield one. You send it a thing, it makes a generator, it yields one item. that can then forget it. So now we use that instead of sending a list in. And that actually works. Um, it groups things. Works on list and generators, terminators. You can con the garbage collect everything. It's not that fancy. Um, and you can't consume things out of order, which is a very niche use case. But whatever, let's fix it. Let's over-engineer this properly. <laughs> so um, if you generate one chunk, keep it around, iterate over the next chunk, items will be yielded out of order. So if you do this, you make an iterable, you get some chunks, you get first and your second chunk, 
you say next to the first one and you get, you get one. Um, then you get the... Uh, uh. Mm. Anyway, um, so aim of this. Works the iterator's list, minimal number of items from the generator, nice garbage collection, allows out-of-order consumption of chunks, terminates, and is fancy enough. I wrote a thing, it's bigger than I thought it would be. Um, this does all of the things, all of them. It just... It, yeah. Um, so, groups things, works and lists and generators, terminates, all items can be garbage collected, minimal look ahead used, allows out of order consumption, over engineered, no known issues, yet. Thanks, Dan. So definitely our award for best use of the full five minutes so far this conference, so thank you very much. Uh, is uh, Tisham Da here? You are? Great, so you're up on deck. But first, uh, Nick James with Pi03. All right, so there was this wonderful thing that happened at PyCon US this year where someone overheard someone say that a, something sounded like Python 2.7 fan fiction. So we got this idea. We should create an anthology of fan fiction. <laughs> so we are collecting these fan fiction, art, poetry, everything. But we need more. We're going to turn this into an anthology that we auction off at the PyLadies auction. But we need more. So what do we mean? Ba, 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 ba. The rules. You must have Python in your story, picture, art, poetry, song, whatever it is that you choose to do. You must keep it PG-13. Um, avoid using real humans unless you have permission. I guess you can use yourself. Um, stories can't violate the COC of PyCon. So everything is welcome, whether it be stories, art, poetry. We need more. So the deadline for your idea is September 1st. You don't have to have the full thing all fleshed out and everything. We just need your idea to make sure that it is, follows the rules. Um, submit the pitches through GitHub. You add your pitch to the appropriate folder, which looks like this. No, nope. There. Um, got it all worked out. Um, again, deadline September 1st. Or you can... You can find the link at pi03.com. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Brett Swanson, you're around. Brett? Great. Uh, so you're up on deck on this side. Uh, and we're ready over this side. So Thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. our uh, next presenter is uh, Tisham Da, who's going to be talking about Tracking trucks in East Africa using satellites and words. Okay, so I just got back from Nairobi on Thursday and I was working at this place called Lorry Systems. I do tech stuff there. Uh, this is like a thing that runs on our screen to make us feel good uh, with nice stock photos of trucks. <laughs> uh, this is not Africa. We do well, we present well. Uh, and this is a question we hear all the time in the office, which is ukoapi. It's like with question mark and exclamation mark, people are not sure where the truck is. <laughs> uh, we did an app, and we gave it out to uh, truckers, but truckers are only have, there's only like 40% smartphone penetration. The rest of the people have feature phones, and uh, feature phones can't run the app. Yeah, uh, I'm sure there will be a GPS-based feature phone which is, will survive in the truck environment at some point. Uh, and uh, so then uh, we gave out a few 10 phones to people uh, which we bought from, the, from some money we had and then they just went about into the villages. Uh, yeah, so this was a hard question to answer. So we were like, what do we do? And sometimes the answer to the question is not these images. Uh, the answer is this. <laughs> uh, this is a truck outside our office in Mombasa. It's not our truck, thankfully. We don't have any trucks. This is not our truck that was moving with us. 
Uh, well, I, was, I took an image of the container. We are doing some reading of the container text. So that was interesting as well, but also where a truck can be stuck. Uh, so I was looking at people who provide tracking in Kenya. And this was one of the companies which provides tracking in Kenya, and this is their site. Uh, so I was like, there's no HTTPS, there's no domain name. Should I pay these guys my money? <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I was like, OK, how hard can tracking be? So I went to AliExpress, I bought some stuff. <laughs> I went out to the streets in Nairobi, and I bought some stuff. And I don't know if any of you guys watch Dave Jones. It's like, don't turn it on, open it up. So I opened them up to have a look at what's inside. Uh, so the, the thing to the, I guess to my left, is, the, is a car charger. So that's what the inside of a car charger looks like for USB. And uh, to the, uh, the other side is the GPS tracker and the little ceramic -y shiny thing somewhere here is what sees the satellites. So there are some satellites involved in here. Uh, hopefully the truck sees them, hopefully it's in the right location. And uh, this is an open source Java, unfortunately, fleet tracking system. I haven't found a Python one yet, so please, somebody write one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there are a lot of uh, data formats from all these trackers. They've all been reverse engineered. Uh, they, they are listed in partic this particular page, and you can read the data that's coming off the tracking thing. There's a SIM. The SIM is an M2M SIM. The M2M SIM means it doesn't have a number. It can only be accessed via API. Uh, and then that data is, goes into a particular port. Uh, Infrastructure is in AWS, and the port load balancer and some HTTP load balancers and that are stored. It's good, all good. Uh, so the only bit of Python here is the moving the data around. Uh, if you haven't, uh, there was a talk about Celery. This is another alternative to Celery you can run on AWS where you schedule stuff in Lambda and you just run a function. Uh, so the data, the tracking data is checked for whether the truck has arrived or not regularly. Uh, this is the other thing from names. So no satellites involved. We can only afford so many trackers. And it's hard, getting stuff into Kenya is hard. So uh, we call up the drivers and say, Uko Api, and then tell us a name. And then we put the name through creative use of the Google Places and <laughs> <laughs> Places API and uh, uh, Names uh, API, where some of it is uh, Ambiguous, so the ambiguity is resolved by making sure it's in Kenya, it's somewhere in East Africa, it's somewhere along the route, it's, there are heuristics for the, the place name that comes after is logically in the route after the, the place name that was before, and so you transform words into places and show some 800 trucks. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. You seem to know where your trucks are better than where, than where I know my car is, so that's, uh, that, that's, that's quite good. Uh, Amber Brown, you're up on deck. Uh, but first, Brett Swanson, who is going to be talking about using Sphinx and Jira and Python to automate the creation of software release reports. Yeah. That's right. OK. Thanks, yeah, so uh, I'm Brett Swanson. This is my first PyCon. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, that picture is um, our head office in Sydney here at um, Macquarie University. We have about 600 people there. Uh, we sold a billion and a half dollars worth of product last year, so we're a reasonably sized company now. Um, so yeah, so we make cochlear implants that allow deaf people to hear. Uh, because it's an implanted medical device, it's a very heavily regulated kind of business, so we need a lot of documentation. And um, one of the things we have to produce is a, a software release report for different pieces of software that we make. Um, typically, we would have a Microsoft Word template for something like that, and in an in example case, you know, there'd be a couple of tables that you'd have to fill with information that you'd maybe get out of JIRA, which we use for our issue tracking. So the tables might be, you know, what bugs are being fixed in this release, uh, what improvements and new features you might have, and what known bugs are, are still in this piece of software. So it's a bit of a manual process. Um, so far, so I thought I'd automate it, and I just picked um, a sort of internal kind of research project 
rather than a, a piece of product software. Um, so for example, uh, yeah, here's Jira, our issue tracker. So normally we would just use it from the web browser and you can export data from, from the browser in a, a variety of different formats, but then somehow I've got to get that into the, into the Word document, which is a bit tedious. But uh, Atlassian uh, also provide a nice Python interface, so I thought I'd have a, a go at using that. And uh, I chose uh, Sphinx, which is the you know, documentation system that's used for the Python documentation itself. And it's uh, quite a nice system. And you make text files and then you process them in, in Python and it turns into, say, a web page or a bunch of web pages. So I needed to uh, put some information into a table. So I had to look at how Sphinx handles tables. So there's a couple of different ways you could do it. And um, this first one, I thought, well, it looks a bit complicated for me to build in my script. Um, so don't want to do that. Um, they have these ones that are simple tables, but that's a bit hard if, if you've got like quite a lot of words in each column, so that wasn't good. So instead, they have these other nice things, CSV tables and list tables, so I decided to use list tables. So basically, I just had to make um, my Python script, go up, go up to Jira, and then kind of populate this text file so that the, um, you know, we use list table, um, the column's going to be issue, the summary, and what kind of verification we've done. Um, and so I just had to write a little script that went through found the issues and pulled that information out of JIRA. So that was pretty good. Um, one little thing that was a good tip was I had to put this class long table in and that way if I want to turn it into a PDF file later, um, that allows the tables to break across pages. It took me a while to figure that out. Um, so that's the slide. So I'll show you what, what the end result looked like. We've got a job going for a senior, senior Python development. Developer. But anyway, here's a, uh, here's a, uh, oh, okay, there's the document. There it is. Oh, thanks, Brett. It's really cool to see, um, like, see new features of restructured text and, and Sphinx that, that I certainly haven't seen before, and seeing that from a new speaker at the conference is great. Uh, Cormac Kickett, if you can set up over here, that would be amazing. Uh, and now we have everyone's favourite twisted <laughs> burb, burb. <laughs> uh, Amber Brown, Woo! with string encodings and how we got in this mess. Uh, so thanks to the wonders of desktop Linux, I can now actually see my speaker's notes because this screen is blank. Thanks, Arch Linux. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, hi, I'm Hockey. So you have some text. We all have text, like an instant message or, you know, Twitter, etc. But you need to encode it to put it on a wire because, you know, networks don't work in text. They work in bytes, one and ones and zeros, on and off. So you need to use a text encoding, but what even is that? Well, it all started back in 1870 when we had bad ideas and didn't realise that there were languages other than English. It was a five-bit encoding, and as an example, you have uh, five bits here. It could encode pretty much all of the, uh, what we would call the Latin alphabet, so A to Z, uh, one to nine, a couple of other characters uh, to help along transmission, about it. ITA2, which came later, changed things up a bit, still used in like ham radio, in 19, uh, but it's from 1924, still five-bit. Uh, it changes around the encoding from ITA1 because we didn't really have to persist data back then. It didn't really matter if uh, the encoding changed because it was very ephemeral. Uh, so there's also this thing called BCD or binary character something. <laughs> IBM did it. <laughs> so it was a six-bit-ish encoding and it was basically what was on punch cards. It was never really standardised and sometimes you had punch cards that would work in one machine and would be total gobble mess in another. And I don't know how to encode it because why would you ever need to encode to a literal physical punch card in 2018? But in the digital age, IBM realised that rather than come up with a nice system, they'll just take the encoding of the punch cards and just put it on the computer and go, done. It's great. So in 1928, no, 
1960s, and it forgot to update that date, mm -hmm. they decided to do it. It was an 8-bit encoding, so it could actually store more than the, just the English language, and you could have things like Russian. So that's good. But the Americans were up to their old tricks. <laughs> <laughs> and in 1963, uh, they standardized the 7-bit US ASCII. So you could do things like, you know, <laughs> Letters, except if you wanted like the British pound symbol, well, that's not American. It's not freedom. <laughs> There's only freedom here. So you don't get that. Now, the Japanese were also up to their own thing, because they also, they were like, we, we have different characters, please. We need to encode them. We need to send letters. So they came up with something called GISX02. 01 in 1969 and shift yes in 1997. It was an 8 bit variable encoding. Now, what variable encodings are is that for certain characters, for example, the Latin alphabet, um, and some uh, Japanese characters only f uh, were able to fit in one byte. However, there were some that couldn't fit. So they had a little, uh, there was a rule that, you know, if it had this, uh, this uh, number in it, like the, I think it's, I forget which section is, signifies that it's actually a two-byte thing, so you can encode much more. Of course, the Americans were still up at it, and they encoded ISO, uh, there was ISO 8859, or Latin 1, is the most common one in 1987. Now, you could actually encode things like the, the um, British poundy, um, but uh, there were still problems because you had to switch, you had a different encoding for all these different languages. Finally, we had UTF-16, which, you know, had eight, uh, 16, uh, byte, uh, 16 bit um, variable length. So some things were in two bytes. UTF-8, which is what we use now, is a bit more compact. So we're all good, right? Nah. <laughs> Lots of those things are still around. So you end up with things called Mojibak, which ends up where the pound symbol, if you encode it with uh, Latin one, ends up being garbled mess. And that, and then if you try and do some Japanese, it just bleh. So you have some bytes. How do you know what it is? Well, you kind of just have to guess, because it could be a code page of anything. It could be Russian. Uh, Python has a thing called PET538. It makes this a lot better. Thank you. And, uh, and that was a verb on wire protocols. Twisted developer. You had your five minutes. Um, um, Libby Berry, uh, you're up on deck. But first, uh, Cormac, kick it with. You removed a word from your front slide. Uh, this one yeah. says simple on it. Yeah. His doesn't. Yeah. Uh. Hey, hey guys, uh, I'm Cormac Kickett. I'm a grade 12 student at Gungahlin College, and I'm competitive. Well, just a bit. Yeah. <laughs> so two years ago, uh, back in grade 10, we had a final project coming up, and I wanted to do something crazy in order to beat everyone else. I wanted to make a 3D physics engine in Python. So Python actually makes this really easy. Um, there's a ton of useful libraries that you can use. So for example, there's PyMonk. This can be used to do the um, 3D physics simulations. Pipe and GL can be used to render the feed environment. And to Kinta can be used to build the GUI for the application. However, why use all these fancy modules and libraries when we can just use Pygame? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for those of you who don't know Pygame, it has some nice features. Uh, there's no physics simulations capable in it. Uh, you can't do any 3D rendering. <laughs> yeah. There's no GUI framework. <laughs> but you can draw triangles and lines. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just like quickly showcase my thing. So um, here's the game. You can like move around in this 3D environment. Ooh. And you can build stuff by just clicking on points and like pressing build. Ooh. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah uh, bef <laughs> so before I actually like, yeah. So, yeah, so before I actually like show the physics simulation, I just want to explain how it works. So I guess the fundamental building block of it is the point. So the point is just two vectors. Um, there's a position vector, which is like the green circle in it, and there's a velocity vector, which is the pink arrow. 
So in each frame, uh, you calculate the velocity vector and you add it to the position vector, like that. This is like pretty simple, but you can make it as complicated as you want. Uh, so for example, if you want to simulate gravity, you could have a vector going downwards and just add it to the velocity each frame, like that. Or if you want to simulate collisions, you could like flip it on like the vertical axis or something, like that. So this is fine, but it only really allows us to simulate points moving in a 3D environment. So what if we wanted to simulate more complex objects, like um, a cube or a pyramid? This, this may sound really difficult, but it's actually pretty simple. So um, first we just break down the object into triangles, which um, is pretty easy to do. And then we just split it down further into sticks, or lines. I, I just like calling them sticks. So um, each stick in my simulation is just a line and then two points. So the line just represents how far the points should be from each other. So we do the same thing as we did before. We calculate the position vectors and the velocity vectors and just add them like that. And then we just readjust the points to make sure that they stay the same distance from each other. Like that. And we do this like 10 times a frame for each stick in the simulation. And this like relatively simple process allows me to do stuff like this. So I'll just try and open it. So yeah, here's a fabric. And as you can see, you can like move it around. And like behaves pretty realistically. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, is that all? I'm not. Uh, he's uh, still going. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. But um, in, oh, no, 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 the, the other right hand side, keep going. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, my GitHub <laughs> link is on my screen. Oh, yeah, there it is. So if you want to see the rest of the code, because I didn't actually explain how to do the GUI or um, the rendering. So if you want to see it, you can click that link or type it in, whatever. And yeah, anyway, <laughs> thank you for listening. Uh, if anyone wants to come up and click on the screen later, there'll be an opportunity at the end of the lightning talks. Uh, thank you. Uh, that, that wasn't simple. Okay, thanks. Um, Lewis, uh, um, Lewis B, your handwriting is terrible. I can't read your name, I'm sorry. Uh, Lewis, uh, you're up on this side. But first, uh, Libby Berry with Python Bugs. Very vaguely named. Hi, I'm Libby. This is my first PyCon and also my first lightning talk. So, ah, okay. So, I'm Libby. I know a little about a lot of different things. So, a little bit of background. I studied graphic design in college. Then I was like, shit, I really am interested in biology and bioinformatics. So, I went to uni and did that. And then I was like, I don't really want to do any research. And so, I went into web development. And so, <laughs> as a result, I went, wind up doing mostly JavaScript and PHP in my j day job. So, I don't know enough Python to sort of comfortably do a lightning talk on it. So, here I am talking to you across the chasm of logic that I had to leap over in order to have a subject that I felt comfortable talking about that was even remotely interest, uh, related to Python. I'm going to talk to you about a type of parasite that can be found in snakes. <laughs> <laughs> I also, I apologize for my voice. I'm recovering from a cold. So my voice is the right amount of sultry, but with the wrong amount of congested. <laughs> I was convinced to do a talk by multiple people, but I felt way over my depth. The reason why I came here in the first place was I wanted to get back into Python and R because I did a little bit of it in bioinformatics, and I wanted to become enthusiastic about the language again by making friends. And the way that I do that as someone who's very interested in strange biology is to show people gross things. <laughs> so here's, here's my moment. Here's your moment to leave if you don't like any talk related to parasites. I'm not going to show you anything extremely gross. I realize that would be off-putting to many people. There will be one x-ray. I will say x-ray on and x-ray off when I'm putting it on and off. So you can either leave the room now or you can close your eyes. But I promise you it is not that gross. Just so that's out of the way. Also, while I did do some parasitology T parasitology units, I am no expert. I am also not a science communicator, so don't just take this with a grain of salt, but take it heavily seasoned. So first, <laughs> what is a parasite? A parasite is a type of symbiotic relationship where a organism benefits directly off a host while harming the host. It doesn't necessarily have to be a one-to-one -one relationship. There can be multiple hosts involved that the parasite can occupy in order to grow up and uh, enough to replicate and pass on its genome so long as they're multiple phylogeny. So, Pentastomida. 
Penta, five, five openings. Only one is a mouth, four are hooky things that it can attach onto so it can, you know, stay still while it sucks the blood out of whatever host organism it wants. It is a phylum that is very, very old. They have found fossils of this thing that are 425 million years old, which is just wild to me. I felt like it was appropriate to call this uh, title like python bugs because it is related to arthropods and annelids, which are both bug-like things. So there's the joke there. Ha, huh? relevance, <laughs> I have my moment of pride. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's very, very varied. It contains too many families. It's beyond the scope of this. I have two minutes left. Let's go. So, <laughs> here's Curly Boy. He has a parasite. <laughs> he has a parasite infection. He is the primary host. Luckily for him, it's in, within the parasite's interest for him to stay alive, so he can reproduce. So he just has like a respiratory infection. He coughs up some bugs. Bugs. The bugs remain in the environment, can last for ages. An intermediate host, in most cases, particularly if we're talking about a python, it'll be something like a mouse, will eat something that has these eggs on it. The eggs will burrow through their intestinal tract to wherever is warm and safe and nice, and it will grow up. Here's where things go wrong. So, parasites don't usually care about their intermediate host. They just care enough for it to grow up and then move on. It doesn't really care if the intermediate host lives during or after that, especially like during if they're looking for people which will like eat it. Um, so it, when it develops cysts, it's not fun for anyone, any uh, intermediate host at all. You get flu-like symptoms. If you're a human, it will be most likely misdiagnosed. You have flu-like symptoms, you probably have a cold or a flu, not necessarily a parasite. Um, also, if you are a human who gets a very, very heavy infection, you get comorbidities. That is a disease that comes along as the result of another thing. So you might not die directly from parasites, but you might die from septicemia caused by parasites. Okay, x-ray on. This is what a type of parasitic infections looks like. It's tiny things. Those tiny C shapes are cysts that are formed by them. Okay, x-ray off. Okay, <laughs> the best thing about this is most human infections are asymptomatic. <laughs> Talk to me after if you want more info. I'm gonna... <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, you didn't put your name on your slide. I, I you have a lanyard? Yes. Cool. Uh, okay, um, so up on deck, uh, we have Aidan Pulford on this side. But first, uh, Lewis Bobberman with yes. Don't Do This. Hey, folks. Uh, this is my first lightning talk, so go easy on me. Uh, yeah, don't do this. Who am I? Um, I'm from Brisbane. I'm studying software engineering at the University of Queensland. I work at Polymathian, and I'm on a committee of Code Network, which is a like, group of like 4,000 developers based in Brisbane. Anyway, what is this talk? It's bad code. Hopefully, I want to teach you something from my madness. Eh, let's see how that goes. Let's start. I'll start small. It'll get worse, trust me. Raise your hands, who's ever thought, parentheses are lame, the cool kids use square brackets. There's actually some hands, I was not prepared for this. <laughs> well, have I got the code for you. So this is a class that acts as a decorator, takes a function, and also overrides get item with args, which will return calling the function with those arguments. <laughs> um, apply it to this innocent function name, which says hello, format name, and then prints hi Tom. And notice that you're calling the function with square brackets because parentheses are lame. <laughs> Who here likes Haskell? Raise your hands. You're thinking this is a trap. You're right. <laughs> My favorite part of Haskell is currying. If you don't know what that is, it's like partially applying uh, arguments to a function. You can do it in Python using functools.partial. It's a bit verbose. I'm not a huge fan of it. So I found a better way to do it. 
Again, another class takes a function. This time also initializes args to an empty array, uh, overrides or to append to the args, and then overrides call, which will do things. <laughs> I created a function which just adds two numbers, and then add five, you just do innocent or five, which will make a b five. Print out add five on two, you've now got seven. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Who is forced to use Python 2 and miss out on some of those awesome Python 3 features? I know I am. I thought there'd be more of you. You are a very lucky crowd. Uh, so one feature that a lot of people love is F strings. Python 2 doesn't have them. If you don't know what that is, it's where you put an F before your string and then it will, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, and then it will like evaluate the variables without an to call dot format on it. So I was like, I work in Python 2, I want that, I made it. <laughs> so instead of just, <laughs> yes. So instead of just prefixing your string with f, you call f as a function on it. So how this works is, the double, double, under, or the double underscore import double underscore inspect is basically importing inspect and then returning it. Current frame gets you the current calling frame. Dot f back gives you the parent frame and dot f locals gives you a dictionary of key to variable value in that frame. So basically you're going to the parent calling frame, getting the locals and passing them all into format. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> now, <laughs> who saw the flip flop parader and thought, I want this for legitimate reasons that actually exist and not just to annoy my coworkers? <laughs> There's some hands. Have I got the code for you? <laughs> so, um, Similar to how the other one works, it uses inspect on current frame and getting the back, but this time it also gets the frame info on it, like the file name, the line, the function name, uh, the index, and some other stuff. It uses a cache, and then it stores the cache of that calling thing, and stores the toggled value, and then uses the values on A or B, which allows you to get the flip flop operator in Python, just calling FF on two expressions. You're welcome. And now you're thinking, well, these are all cool, but is there a way to use them together? <laughs> yes. So this uses square brackets currying, and, thank, and then, yeah, all of them together. Thanks. Um. So you know that f string thing's in the standard library, right? In Python 2? Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's either in the email thing or it's in Mailman or something like that. It's, it's been, it's no been there for 12 fun, years. Though. Wow. Yeah. It's very exciting. Uh, uh, so I seem to have created a string of talks about um, code issues. Uh, Meryn, you're up on this side in a moment. But first, we have Aidan Pulford with confessions of a go-to user. That is a Give fact. him an applause. <laughs> that is a fantastic talk to go after, considering. <laughs> yeah, you're going to recognize some of the stuff in it, actually. Um, so. <laughs> I have a confession to make. I love GoTo, and I have for a long time now. Uh, it has followed me for almost all of my programming career. Uh, from my uh, distant childhood, a uh, very long time ago, uh, all the way to the present. So it goes all the way back to about five years ago, when I just started programming in Batch. Now, I don't know if uh, you're all familiar with Batch, but you don't actually have much of a choice uh, regarding GoTo, and Year 7 me definitely didn't. So I was making all sorts of text adventures 
in batch. And the way I'd move it between all of the things was with go to. Um, and then I got frustrated at something. I don't know what. It was probably go to. Uh, and then I moved on. Uh, I didn't code for another three years until I came to my current school, uh, which and I'm in about year 10 now. And I'm taking an IT course uh, on Grok Learning. Love you guys. Do not blame them. Um, <laughs> and uh, we move on to an Arduino assignment in the end of the first semester. Uh, and I hit a problem. Oh, wait, sorry. I actually skipped something. Uh, this is how GoTo works for all of you who are just missing the joke at the moment. Um, basically, what GoTo does is it moves you through the code. So if you have a look at this example, uh, what happens is you run procedurally through this until you hit the go to. Uh, in batch, echo is print, basically, in this case. So it goes to go to, then it goes back up to middle, and then it keeps going back down as if nothing happened. And it gives you something like that. Um, <laughs> all right, so back to the story of year 10 me, who's using go to again. Uh, I hit a problem. I'm not sure what the problem was, actually, because uh, that's at the end of void loop. And I sent us back to the top of it. Um, which, for those of you who aren't familiar with Arduino, happens anyway. Um, <laughs> I, uh, and I also uh, used it two other times in the code. Uh, and I'm not sure why I used it, but I was hooked. And so w at the end of that unit, we go back to Python, and I'm heartbroken, because Python does not natively have go to. And my, my young, impressionable self starts looking out in the community for go-to libraries. But we haven't covered object-oriented programming like fully at this point, so I'm not really able to understand what's going on. And I go, why don't I make it myself? So this is the earliest version of that from year 10. Uh, what it's a <laughs> <laughs> it works, sort of. If you put this at the top of your file, you will go to where you flagged. However, uh, it can't import a file with this in it and then start using go to in a different folder because file will always go back to the one that the function's actually written in. Um, and I'm in year 10 at this point. I have assignments coming in. I'm working on some year 11 classes as well, so some things actually matter. And so I'm basically, uh, I give it up because it's on the back burner. It's not as important as my actual classwork. Um, until yesterday. <laughs> Inspired by the warnings talk, specifically, uh, specifically about the parts about deprecated code, um, I, uh, I made this with the help of one of my classmates. Oh, wait. No, sorry. This is, this is actually a Stack Overflow thing, where Stack Overflow told me about inspect, like the, the clever bastards they are. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know what's happening here, uh, basically, it's inspecting the current frame, which is saying, what happened just now? Uh, let's go back one step and get the global variables from them, get the file that was active then, read it, split it, and get the, um, do, do what it was doing in the previous example. So this is what um, I made yesterday. Uh, <laughs> basically, what happened is <laughs> uh, it goes through the file. It, goes, it recurs backwards and forwards at the same time, in a sense. Uh, it goes through the iterations, because the previous example could only be called once, uh, and then it would break with, from a different file. This one goes back through all of the previous iterations of go to until it hits the base file, and then goes all the way back to, <laughs> to print um, what was happening. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so. I really appreciated that you had that section where you explained for all the people slightly older than you uh, what GoTo actually yeah. does. <laughs> Most of us have skipped that. Um, I, think, I, I think people who are older than that can agree that we can finally remove the question mark from that famous paper, GoTo Considered Harmful. <laughs> uh, Andrew Leach, uh, you're up on deck. You again. Hi, I'm Meryn. This is my first PyCon. <laughs> this is not my first lightning talk. This PyCon. <clears throat> so, uh, some of you may remember from the last couple of days, there's been some discussions of flip-flop operators. 
Uh, and so we've been, uh, this lightning talk is going to be a face off of different implementations in Python <laughs> of the flip flop operator. You may be asking why? <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, again, for some background, for those of you who weren't around today, and to just uh, dig in on blame Tom a little bit. Uh, so Tom mentioned in his uh, in his in his keynote, um, or kind of mentioned <laughs> Ruby's uh, flip flop operator. Suggested I do a lightning talk about it. I did, uh, and then um, uh, suggested that someone might. Um, might implement a flip-flop operator for Python over the end of the weekend. Um, not just someone did did that. Uh, at last count, we have six implementations, <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to judge them. So we have two guest judges, uh, Zach Hatfield Dodds and Tom Eastman. Okay, wait, 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 wait. This is not my fault. <laughs> okay, okay. Listen, listen. There are there there's 600 people in here. Did, did I speak the words <laughs> flip-flop last night? I didn't speak a single word. Okay. All right, all right, that's, that's Tom. And uh, Zach, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Uh, I'm Zach. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> many, many of you Good. might have heard me talk yesterday. I found out I was apparently a celebrity and a judge at 3.20. So, <laughs> so I've uh, invented some rules, uh, the rules for judging these implementations. Does it work? Is it a good idea? Does it have pizzazz and extra points for arbitrary reasons? So the first implementation that we are looking at is the uh, uh, flip flop operator PyPy package. So um, Flowblock actually got this up on on PyPy in the last um, in the last 20 hours this morning. It's quite impressive. There's documentation. There's tests. Uh, I'm not sure what that square is. I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a square in the original it's, thing. It's meant to be a diagraph from the Canadian, Canadian Aboriginal Salabic block, which is a valid Python identifier <laughs> consisting of two dots. Right. All right. So uh, can we get some uh, some judgment? We're going to have to go really quickly because. So uh, does it work? Maybe. Maybe. Does it, is it a good idea? No. <laughs> does it have pizzazz? Yes. 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 All right. Two ticks. Uh, any extra points for arbitrary reasons? No. Uh, one point for being on PyPI. One point, yes. yes. OK. Uh, one or two? Yes. 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 All right. <laughs> uh, go, 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 go. We've got an implementation from Nathan Crake. Uh, it supports multiple syntaxes. We can use uh, different types of things. Uh, and we've got a little uh, example of it there. Uh, does it work? Maybe. We're not sure. <laughs> Is it a good idea? No. <laughs> does it have pizzazz? Half points. Cool. Uh, yeah. All right, half a pizzazz. Any extra points for arbitrary reasons? Half a point for two syntaxes. Half a point for two syntaxes. Cool. All right, now we've got this whole thing. We've got a real infix operator from Samuel Bishop. <laughs> does it work? It, it does work. I tested this one. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a good idea? No. <laughs> <laughs> Minus one point. <laughs> Pizzazz. Yes, yes, it's amazing. <laughs> Extra points for arbitrary reasons? No. It's an infix operator, so two points, but again, minus one, because if you take the brackets off the conditions, it breaks. Also, it looks like a TIE fighter. <laughs> <laughs> bonus point for TIE fighters. Bonus point All right, for TIE right. Uh, now we've got one from Lewis in the, from the previous, uh, the previous lightning talk. <laughs> <laughs> He's really just getting in. All right, does it work? We think yes, so. Yes, I think it does. Yeah. And he, he actually got this in first. He got this in... Uh, like at midnight. Like at midnight. So that's a choice you can make with your evening. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Does it work? Yes. Not sure. Yes? Yep. Uh, is it a good idea? No. <laughs> <laughs> we know this one, right? <laughs> does it have pizzazz? Yep. 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 Extra points. The stack thing blew my mind. I, I really loved that. Uh, all right, and now we've got two. We've got 13 seconds left, but we uh, we'll keep going. All right. <laughs> uh, so you and McNeil actually uh, made two different implementations, um, both a context and a generator-based uh, thing. <laughs> was some um, yeah. Let's let's, uh, let's take them together. Does does it work? It seems to have worked. I think it yeah, works. Yeah, it looks yeah. like it works. Is it a good idea? No. No. <laughs> 
Does it have pizzazz? Yeah, the, the, the two implementations. Yeah, are cool. yeah. I Some think variety. It's, yeah. Extra points for arbitrary reasons? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So despite the minus points for being a good idea, uh, we've, we've got a winner, and it's Sam uh, for building an infix operator. I've uh, got you a, a tiny, um, what Get are they stage, a jandal. Do we have Sam? Audience. Do we not have Sam? We do have Sam. Uh, it's also got road signs on it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, Thank you, Chris. Uh, I, I apologise profusely. <laughs> this, this got out of hand. Um, so, uh, Nick Coglin, you are up on deck on this side. Um, this talk has a remarkably long title, which I'm going to read in its entirety, well, which is yeah. How to do Embedded Device Development Better with MicroPython and Jupyter. It's ready for professional use. So good. Pretty please. I have lights and live demos, so it will be a good laugh. Please welcome Andrew Leach. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Andrew. At Planet Innovation, I'm lucky enough to be working on our first medical device running on MicroPython. This is great fun. MicroPython's letting us really change the way we think about the possibilities of embedded development. It's giving us lots of new tools, and more importantly, it's letting us reuse a lot of Python code that's already out there. In our particular case, we've got an existing product with a Python desktop app that we want to turn into a standalone, so we can just look at sharing that code from the desktop straight to the Python, MicroPython, and get it standalone. This will speed up development and allow us to have better tested code, previously tested code, up and running quickly. But the only problem we're running into so far is there's a bit of a lack of debugging opportunities in MicroPython. Especially as Python developers, we're used to line by line stepping through debugging. Embedded developers, we're used to GDB, line by line debugging. But that's OK, Python's easy. So we can just go back to the good old days of flash our chip, plug in the serial port, and look at the print statements. That does the job. Not so much. Jupyter Notebook. We all love Jupyter. We've gone too far. Doesn't matter. <laughs> it does, actually. <laughs> come back, come back, come back. <coughs> we'll get there. Jupyter. So there's been a Jupyter Notebook kernel for MicroPython around for a little while by Goat Church Prime. It never got published to PyPy, but it's got a lot of functionality. I've had to rework that a bit, take it a bit further. It's now on PyPy, and we can just start talking to our MicroPython devices easily from Ooh. Jupyter. Ooh. Edit, run, edit, run, rinse and repeat. This kernel also lets us run some cells on the local environment. So you can see we have CPython rather than MicroPython. You can edit files, look at stuff, or uh, use widgets. Ooh. So this is stuff I can't do when I'm doing C++ development on a microcontroller. This opens up some new possibilities of debugging that I'm not used to having before. So we're sort of getting into some new ways of thinking about what we can and can't do. Another bit of fun, I know Damien's already left, but a little while back he started a pull request on MicroPython called mpREPL, which uses the virtual file system in the MicroPython board and gives you this little tiny remote folder, which is actually the local folder on your PC. So this lets you open, read, write, copy files from your PC to MicroPython on the fly and eventually import files straight from PC when it gets there. This makes it potentially a lot easier to deploy your applications onto your MicroPython board. So for a start, we can flash the board, ROM on, or within the same Jupyter. Then we can copy our important libraries on. Happy days. And within this kernel, 
and even in the original one, you can define a file in a cell and let's send it to a file. Easy. Unplug, replug. Yes. We've now got a deployed MicroPython <laughs> development. I got time. Let's go for gold. So, OpenMV, for those who don't know, this was a Kickstarter a few years back. It's a camera board, all completely open source, running MicroPython. So, with this, we've got 11 lines of text. Smile. That is connecting to the board, configuring the camera sensor, compressing it to JPEG, or taking a photo, compressing to JPEG, copying to the PC, and locally, <laughs> we've got some bright lights. <laughs> With all the time left available, thanks. Thanks so much to Damien and everyone who's helped and contributed. So yes, the kernel is on PyPy. Pi. Feel free to have fun. Yeah, and we're done. Great. Thank you. Two, two seconds left, not quite full use of the time. It's very disappointing. I, was, I also promised two lights. Were there two lights in that? Multiple lights? Yeah. Two there lights. Were? Oh, great. It did yeah. say lights, plural. Yes, yeah, okay, lights great. on this board. Cool. Um, uh, I told Nick that he was doing this lightning talk first thing this morning, and here <laughs> is Nick with that lightning talk. And this is the last lightning talk as well, so if we can have a, at least one Katie on this lectern over here <laughs> setting up while Nick's talking, that would be great. Uh, Nick Coglin. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about controversial peps you've probably never heard of, even if you're over 40, and I get to make over 40 jokes now. <laughs> um, so, pep, what is a pep? A pep is a Python enhancement proposal. Uh, they're the way we handle Python language and ecosystem change proposals that are too complex to be handled, or too complex or controversial to be handled as regular tracker issues on bugs.python.org. And so they're all available online, your URL is there, uh, and the mailing list themselves are online. And we'll Talk more about that later. But Pep I'm going to start with, statically nested scopes. These were available in Python 2.1 from future import lexical scopes, I think, something like that. Uh, and they became the default in Python 2.2. We have an example here, classic counter, uh, in a function that adds something to a value that was provided in the outer function. Python 2.0, you couldn't do this. <coughs> As far as the inner function was concerned, base didn't exist. It's like, what is this base thing you're talking about? I have no base. Or the base belonged to somebody else. <laughs> um, showing my age again. Um, here's a comment from the discussions of statically nested scopes. This will break code. I'm not sure whether it's worth going down this path just for the sake of being able to define functions within functions. Who here has ever defined a function within a function? Yeah. Um, 2000 for you. Pep 318, decorators for function and methods, added in Python 2.4. Who here has ever written at whatever on top of a function? Do you think it makes your code ugly? Do you make it, think, make it horribly obtrusive and hard to read and terribly, terribly intrusive? Well, some people do still believe that, but <laughs> consider, it, consider the old version of it where you had to name the function. Then, after the function, you had to call the decorator with the named function and then rebind it back to the same name. Nobody wants to do that. But yeah, two decorators, class method and static method, been available since Python version 2.2. Discussions have raged off and on on both Complang Python and the Python dev mailing list about how best to implement function decorators. And lots of objections about it being intrusive ugly, lots of objections about there being no obvious way to pronounce it, lots of objections to the fact that this was no longer an executable pseudocode. It's now routinely accepted as a way of marking up callables and classes with extra information. Uh, side note, the original version did not have class decorators in it because there was no obvious use case for them. Python 3.7 has data classes in it, which you mark with a decorator. PEP 308, conditional expressions, added in Python 2.4. Hands up if you've ever written a conditional expression. So, first line there. Arg, if arg is not none, else default. The way people used to write this prior to Python 2.4. Result equals arg is not none, and arg, or default. <laughs> Do you see a problem here? What if arg is zero? 
What if arg is an empty list? What if arg is an empty tuple? Um, yeah. If statement, uh, if conditional expressions were added to get people to stop writing that, and I suspect for anyone who's learned Python in the past 10 years, this may actually be the first time they have ever seen the and or hack. Um, actually, is this, the who, who, is this the first time you've ever seen the and or hack? There's a lot of hands going up. Awesome, we succeeded. <laughs> PEP340, anonymous block statements. These were proposed by Greta Van Rossum. They never shipped. Block expression as var1, block1. One. Does this look familiar to anyone? Seem kind of like anything? From the PEP, block statements provide a method, mechanism for encapsulation patterns of structure. Code inside the block statement runs under the control of an object called the block iterator. Simple block iterators execute code before and after the code inside a block statement. Might be sounding familiar. Block iterators, block iterators also have the opportunity to execute the controlled code more than once or not at all, catch exceptions, or receive data from the body of the block statement. This broke people's brains. This <laughs> broke my brain. Um, one of the things I say about getting commit access to CPython is I got commit access to CPython for arguing with Greedo. This was the argument. <laughs> um, from that pep, we have seen a decade's worth of follow-on development of some of the ideas that were originally expressed in that PEP. Directly coming out of it, we had PEP 342, coroutines via enhanced generators. This is when yield went from being a statement to being an expression, so you could send data back into the generator. Uh, it gave us the with statement, so a constrained version of the block statement that just, just did the exception handling, just let you run the code before and the code after. Um, later on, uh, we got PEP380 for delegating subgenerators with yield from. Uh, and then finally, the other side of it, of the more complex control structures, came with native coroutine syntax with async await. Um, and so, yeah, so that PEP, while never accepted, still laid the foundation for some ideas that are still filtering into Python today. Uh, <laughs> matrix multiplications, most people never seen it. I've, uh, I've always wanted to threaten an overtime speaker with a, um, with a thing that I can threaten them with. Uh, thanks, sir. Uh, what? Oh, God. <laughs> off. Off. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, it's, it's great to see how the, uh, how the PEP process has, uh, has shaped Python over the last however many years it's been. And, uh, it, a lot of really good, uh, a lot of really good things have come from it. A lot of other things have been rejected. Um, I have uh, two talks here for the uh, to be awarded today's um, non-pointed stick. Uh, the first one is a talk that was on topic uh, from Libby Berry, <laughs> the Python bugs talk, and the other one is from uh, a talk with. Uh, code ideas that are worse than his handwriting, don't do this by Lewis Bobberman. Uh, can we have a round of applause for Lewis and don't do this? Uh, and for Python Bugs from Libby Berry. Lewis? Oh, it's hard to tell. Yeah, uh, uh, okay, Tom. <laughs> Libby. Libby, okay, good. We didn't award it to a flip flop operator, which is great. Uh, Libby, uh, you've got a giant plastic thing if you're around here. Here, have the giant staff of Pythonic Enlightenment. Oh, it, uh, it actually does come apart. Yes. <laughs> it's uh, packs in luggage. Um, 